as I mentioned, this is our first deep dive into some of the funding areas that we have a chance to allocate funds on co-budget towards. So in a moment, uh, you'll hear from Naomi about some of our latest work on preprints, and we'll have a discussion and a think about how we can intervene and invest in this area. Um, the ideas and insights within this discussion will be linked back to the preprint area on the uh, collective funding exercise that we've been running through the summit to help inform our, our and those who are not here's uh, funding allocations within the exercise. You can have a look at the current description of the funding area on uh, the co-budget platform using the link that we're going to put in the Zoom chat. Um, but just to let you know that this is kind of what we're working from, and hopefully by the end of the discussion and the presentation, we'll have more to add to that that knowledge and that that uh, that co-budget page as well. With that, I'm going to hand over to Richard, who will introduce the topic and our speaker. Great, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, we're going to I'm going to take control here. Oh, here we go. I have control now. Um, Hello, uh, thank you all for coming to this deep dive session. It's an opportunity for us to get more into the different funding areas that we're, we're talking about and demonstrate and show some of the research that we've done in this in this areas. So um, we are talking today about preprints. And one of the, the things that came very evident to us as we were looking back uh, over the past year um, and then kind of setting for ourselves a mission and where we wanted to go was this idea of understanding do I have control again? There we go. It's the viable and vibrant ecosystem of open tools and technologies in all phases of the research process that can be the default in research. Um, this, if you remember, if you were there for the presentation we did, this uh, the, the first core presentation we did, uh, second presentation for those of you that woke up early or had a, were attended at session, um, Kay mentioned this idea of our causes and conditions. So this is part of our initial cause research in a particular area um, where we wanted to, as part of our the uh, desired outcomes is to capitalize on the prominence of preprints in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so you may have you have seen, probably saw preprints were being mentioned in popular media. Um, and it was, it seemed to be a moment where other people outside of the research space were aware of these. Um, we wanted to be able to use that to look at, you know, talk about how we could build more open um, services, particularly in the case of open source code, open governance, open operations, community uh, led operations. I'm going to ask if you have joined us recently and you don't have your mic muted, if you wouldn't mind doing so, we would appreciate it. Um, also, as part of this, uh, we want to understand how interventions can be co-designed. So while this was focused on preprints, we're also looking at setting the mold for these kinds of, or the structure, if you will, for, for these types of, um, of, of, of things, these uh, co-designed intervention and how we might be able to implement this, both in terms of greater awareness and actually to build more openness in the space. Uh, we were very privileged to have Naomi Penfold, um, a, a highly experienced uh, researcher in the space, join us. Um, and she's going to be leading us through the research that she did. Um, Naomi holds a PhD in metabolic and cardiovascular disease from the University of Cambridge, as a veteran of conversations about preprints from her time at eLife, ASAP Bio, and Pre Review as well. Um, and she joined us as a research associate exploring preprints. And I'm very happy to say she's recently joined us as a research data analyst um, uh, full time. And although I've, I've kind of lost her to the planning for the for this funder summit, but I'm looking forward to having her back and, and working with us as a researcher in this space. Um, she'll be leading us through her research and providing us information to take into discussion uh, later in this session. So I'm gonna turn it over to Naomi and she'll lead us through the work. And she is muted. That's because he <laughs> stopped control. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm just going to fiddle around with the screen just a little bit. Um, thank you for your patience. And thank you, Richard, for that lovely introduction. Um, it's nice to see some familiar faces in the audience today. And after this short presentation, I'm really looking forward to discussion. So yeah, let's kick off. OK. So firstly, um, uh, some of you may know this already, um, but let's just quickly define what we mean by preprints. Um, there are various definitions of what a preprint is. Um, there's some specific details. We're not focusing on refining the definition. So for our purposes, we've been looking at preprints as versions of scholarly manuscripts that are shared online by the authors before they have been formally peer reviewed, which may be through an academic journal and maybe through a different process. 
Um, there are at this point over two and a half million preprints. I don't think there's any single source of truth on this number. And this number also doesn't include SSRN, which was previously set up as a space to share preprints amongst humanities and social sciences research, although now it has other outputs in as well, which is why I've not included it. Um, but a good chunk of that two and a half million, over two million are actually on archive, so on a single on a single service. Um, and this amount of preprints comes from every continent. I found research from the Antarctic Research Station. That's quite exciting. Um, but it also covers many disciplines. So uh, Richard talked about COVID. And obviously, there's been a lot of biology and medicine uh, preprints going on in the past couple of years. But there's a lot more in high energy physics. There's some in economics, other quantitative sciences, as well as legal research um, and some of the more social sciences, too. So what do we mean when we say preprints infrastructure? Well, so with infrastructure, we're always talking about both technical and social infrastructure. And the first thing that comes to mind with preprints are the preprint servers themselves. There's some really big name ones that people might be familiar with. There are also some smaller community run servers. Um, there's a whole plethora of them. So that's where people go to post preprints, but also where people can go and read them. But in addition to that, it's really important to note that there's a lot of technical infrastructure that helps support preprints to be uh, part of the scholarly communications process and really embedded in that process. So people can discover those preprints, they're being indexed, there's metadata, um, and people. there's a lot of tools as well people can use to comment, annotate, review, cite, and build on, on the preprint content itself. And finally, the social infrastructure is really worth mentioning here. Uh, preprints in some communities have taken some uh, some convincing, some people aren't there. Um, and so in all of this, there's an exercise in raising awareness, in training people, in developing policy and best practices, particularly with editorial integrity. And those kinds of practices we see in the journal world have also come into the preprint world for maintaining reputation and quality of content. So those social political services are also key infrastructure in the preprint ecosystem. Um, and when we talk about preprints infrastructure, we are invest in open infrastructure and we're focusing on open infrastructure and principles like community governance and transparent operations, mission aligned revenue streams um, and all those kinds of factors in the preprint infrastructure right now is a whole spectrum of openness and some people may be aligned with those principles of open infrastructure and aspiring towards them, if not completely there. Um, and others may not be aligned. So there's a whole diversity. Um, and I'm gonna speak more about the preprint infrastructure that is not commercially owned, for example, um, or run by academic groups or with academic institutions, but it may not be open source and it may not be open in other ways. Um, we're working with where we're at with the ecosystem at this point. So before I dive into some research, we just wanted to do a quick entry poll <laughs> with you um, and ask you all um, to write into Zoom chat, but um, it, no need to be um, no need to press enter just yet. We'd like you to basically type into Zoom chat your answer to what interests you about preprints infrastructure. Um, and in a minute, I'll say go and we'll all see it come through. Okay, I'm gonna move on now. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, your interest there. That's really helpful. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is based on some preliminary research uh, that we've done over the past few months. Um, this is to first answer the question, what is needed to support viable and sustainable open infrastructure for preprints, um, and comes from desk research as well as interviews with nine different stakeholders from across the space. There are also an additional four people who were involved in reviewing, and I'd like to thank all 13 of those people for their help and support and contributions to this work. A couple are even in the, in the room with us today, so uh, really lovely to have you here, and thank you so much for your help there. If you want to read the report in full, um, there is a link on the screen, uh, but I'm going to take you through some of the key points. OK, so when we think about supporting open infrastructure for preprints, I think it's really important to think about why we want to do that. What's the value of preprints? Um, we've had comments, I think, earlier today about the difference between supporting preprints and other types of scholarly outputs and what we're trying to achieve. Um, so I just wanted to draw up three different ways uh, in which preprints are providing value to scholarship and research right now. Um, so the first is improved productivity and efficiency. This is a very first and foremost value that's obvious to people in the space, which is that 
preprints enable much more rapid sharing of results and they also help to kind of bring some efficiency and peer review efforts um, uh, and this is done in a way that is currently compatible with academic career incentives so the fact that it can work alongside existing traditional journal publishing uh, means that people have felt able to to preprint um, and that means that uh, that value has been able to come through this has been the case in fields um, the bottom left image is meant to be a representation of artificial intelligence for quantum mechanics. Um, although, <laughs> good luck getting that from that image. Um, from like, you know, very high energy physics or like uh, artificial intelligence work through to uh, COVID-19 more recently as well. Um, uh, there's been a lot of experimentation using preprints to share research more rapidly. The second value I wanted to bring up was the ability for preprints to enable more inclusive and equitable participation in scholarship. Um, so preprints are a free, as in no money, way for authors to share and read manuscripts. Um, now, this sounds similar to open access, <laughs> um, but I do want to point out that preprints may not be openly licensed. They're also a version of work. Uh, they may not be the final version of that manuscript. Um, so there is a difference between full open access and preprints. However, that really low barrier to entry in terms of cost has really helped a lot of research uh, to be shared. Um, and for some, it also represents a way to uh, circumvent some of the bias gatekeeping that they might find in some of the um, other spaces. Also, as with all of academic publishing, uh, English is not the only language being used in preprints. Um, we've seen multiple languages, multiple services supporting different languages across the preprint space. Um, so that's another way that um, it's really helping people to share in the language that they wish to share in. And thirdly, uh, something that came through very strongly from this research for the past few months is how um, the preprint space has really enabled people to experiment with scholarly communications. Whilst it's being accepted at the moment by traditional journal publishing and working alongside, that, that has basically enabled scholars to come and vote with their feet and be involved in preprints, which has enabled people to actually uh, experiment with different ways of doing peer review, different ways of curating work, um, some of these are very recent, eLife just switched their model, um, and others have been building over several years. So Peer Community Inn has now got quite a thriving space for some particular domains where, where the community review preprints, and that's the model they're using. Okay, so while the majority of this talk today actually uh, picks on the fact that, as Caitlin said earlier, preprints is an area where we really feel this heightened risk of commercialization uh, and this is why we've prioritized it for investment um, as an area to invest in in open infrastructure but i do want to before i get into that share with you some of the things that are working really well in this space um, and pick up what's what we really you know want to build on and build from so one of the really big points that came across was that it was so valuable uh to make to have preprints as a metadata type in Crossref um, and with other metadata initiatives also ongoing at the moment. Uh, this basically means that preprints are part of the scholarly communications uh, infrastructure and it means that scholars can have a seamless experience. We all know how important that is for adoption. Um, so that, that was really picked up as a, as a highlight and it's taken a lot of work from people to advocate for that inclusion within the scholarly ecosystem. So that's really being appreciated now. Um, the second bright spot is that this work continues. There are several active groups of people, working groups, initiatives, um, organisations that are continuing to raise awareness and develop best practices um, are alive in conversation now to make sure that can happen. So it's really a very active space. Um, thirdly, as well as people helping to develop the standards uh, and the best practices and awareness, there's also individual communities and community leads who are leading with adoption and trying preprints out. Um, some are running their own servers, some are taking on, on the offer of some shared infrastructure and start setting up a server of their own and helping their community to use it. Um, or they're helping with other related initiatives like review. Um, and it really is still a very active space and a lot of different communities have been trying to to work with preprints. And finally, there are several open source technologies, particularly when we think about preprint servers that already exist, uh, that already um, align with the principles of 
um, open infrastructure um, to do with community governance, to transparency, to do with open source technology. Uh, and I've just noted a couple on the slide there. PKP's open preprint system is used by several preprint servers today. Uh, Janeway, uh, there's two notable preprint servers that have recently joined um, Janeway via California Digital Library, uh, I think just in the past year. Um, and there's some services about preprint review that are also built on open source technologies. So, so we're not working from a space where where we need to build, we can build from where we are. Okay, so on to the challenges. So the first one we would pick up, which is what we've heard through multiple conversations, including with uh, folks from these from these services, um, is that there are two well, three preprint services that have very big brand names and good recognition, and that's a real strength. Uh, the brand recognition that Archive and BioArchive and MedArchive have built in the in the 30 and 13? <laughs> I don't I can't remember now how many years um, that they've been going. Um, no, it's less than that. Um, but it's really uh, an indication of how much effort's gone into building community trust in and uh, reputation in the content uh, that they're sharing. Um, so that's a real strong point, but unfortunately, you know, these preprint services face real sustainability challenges. If we look at Cornell um, at Archive, it's run by Cornell uh, University, um, housed in that institution, and they provide a lot of the staffing and support there. It has over two million preprints, is actively used by a lot of domains, but it's in terms of philanthropic funding, it's got one funder that's been helping it, the Simons Foundation, and it's still a large chunk of its income every year. Um, so, uh, and the archive team themselves, you know, are quite honest about the fact that the funding, they need more money, <laughs> they've got to pay staff, they've got to keep developing. Um, and it's really, you know, archives growth is a great success, but it really is a challenge when it comes to keeping going with the funding that they're on. Um, furthermore, um, archive is still the archive that was built 30 years ago, it's running on a, on a legacy code base and is in significant need of modernization. Um, Archive, again, are honest about that, and they've been working over the past few years to do that, but it's a significant challenge. And in the meantime, they've also been dealing with a lot of leadership and staffing changes, which happens to every organization. Um, but, you know, some people think that Archive is, you know, old and, and will always be around, very established and very essential to, to science. But, uh, you know, nothing is too big to fail and it's got significant challenges. Bioarchive and MedArchive are owned and operated by Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. Uh, the latter was co-founded BMJ and Yale University. Um, and they are much smaller at this point, but growing and have been going for um, several years now. Um, and with BioArchive and MedArchive, although unfortunately their funding is not transparent, so we can't really be sure what's going on backstage. And that's one of the issues. Um, we, we are aware that there's been one predominant philanthropic funder uh, helping support the bioarchive and medarchive um, and that's the Chan Zuckerberg initiative and so that brings up the issue of you know reliance on single funders that's that's great while you've got it but what about sustenance what about maintenance how do you continue um, supporting these services they're also run on a on a closed publishing platform with Highwire um, and there's uh, yeah a lack of transparency which means it's quite hard to really uh, assess how they're doing and and make sure that they're held accountable and um, continue to be community led. Um, so we know that these are strong services and we just really want them to be able to continue um, in the direction of the community. Okay, so I'd like to talk as well about the broader space and so not just these dominant preprint servers, but all of the services uh, that we looked at. Um, it was clear that, you know, the financial model for how to support open preprint services is uh, still unknown and in experimentation, and it is a real challenge. So the value of preprints comes from the fact that they're free to post and they're free to read. So you can't charge individual contributors or readers uh, a fee, um, which means, but obviously the services are not free to run. So how do you generate revenue without directly linking it per preprint? Um, we know from what's happened in the space so far that charging a fee based on uh, the, the server volume itself or trying to charge who's running the servers if they're using shared infrastructure is, is gonna be challenging. So OSF preprints have tried this. Um, we know you're in the room with us here today. Um, and when 
when this happened, actually half of the service, almost half of the servers that were using this service had to discontinue their operations, um, at least for the moment. And some have moved to other infrastructure because they just couldn't afford the fee or they disagreed with the approach. So this is a model that's probably not going to work with this community. Um, We've seen membership and supporter models working at a small scale. So some initiatives have managed to get a lot of academic institutions to give them small amounts of money. Um, it's another ask to library budgets, another ask for people to support, but is a great sign of strength that, you know, numerous institutions are sharing the burden across them. Um, and that really helps to like de-risk that single institution point of failure. Um, and it should go without saying that as well as you know, notable institutions like Cornell and Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, there are other services that also have significant in-kind costs being provided by individual institutions, and that's really holding them up. Um, these, this financing is not that transparent, but um, we know from speaking to people that they basically get to work full time because they're allowed to within their job and they're no longer researching or uh, some servers are being provided by an institution and otherwise the service couldn't run because it, it couldn't be done otherwise. Uh, so yeah, there are some individual institutions in this space that are holding up some of these preprint services. And finally, there is grant funding. There are several uh, uh, grant providers uh, and funders who have supported preprint infrastructure so far, but it is at that stage of the startup or Let's, you know, let's help you keep going, but we don't really have an answer at this point of how grant funding can sustain preprints infrastructure in the long term. I'm just going to, I'm not going to skip over this. I think it's also worth noticing that um, the, the people resourcing of this space is also precarious. There's a lot of passionate people and being involved in trying out preprints and trying to get these services to work. And that's not necessarily been in their favor uh, and this is very notable that the person who started Archive themselves moved institutions because what they were doing starting Archive, which at the time was not called that, um, basically wasn't recognised at all. Uh, and this this affected them, but it also affects other people um, uh, who are currently working on preprint space. So we should also think about how much we're relying on people's passion and goodwill. OK. Uh, and one of the final challenges I want to raise, which is like the really pressing one, is that this is a space that um, I think is currently at risk of commercial capture, um, if you like. Um, so, so SSRN, I mentioned earlier, is one of the longest running preprint servers, although it's now has other content. And so it's quite hard to really know how many preprints are there. But it was bought in 2016 by it was acquired by Elsevier. Um, and it's now the mechanism by which Elsevier provide this first look service to their portfolio. So preprints with the Lancet, for example, um, this is how people can see manuscripts while they're in review at any of those journals. And Research Square um, provide a similar service. Um, quite a lot of the Springer Nature portfolio are on that service. Uh, and Springer Nature is a major investor in Research Square. Um, and these journal linked services, uh, they really can provide that value of rapid sharing. Uh, so they deal with the problem of not having to wait months of years while something is in peer review. Um, and they've also got the ready footfall of academics already using them and the manuscripts are coming into them. So it seems obvious that they're following this route because there's been interest in non-journal non spaces. Um, but you'll see on this graph on the right, which is showing the cumulative number of preprint records, um, across time from June 2020 to June 2022. Um, That's quite early on June 2020 for Research Square, this bottom line. And in the meantime, that gap is closed compared to BioArchive and MedArchive combined. So while they're both seeing growth, the gap is closing. And that was just in June this year. Um, and we don't really know what's going to happen next in this space. Um, for me, you know, the risk of commercial capture here is that uh, the commercial preprint services can't really fulfill some of the real value of open infrastructure. So we would stand to lose the kind of community governance that we could have right now um, of preprint services. We stand to lose any operational transparency um, and the ability to innovate, like that real value of having preprints as a space to innovate with scholarly communications. Um, uh, we'd lose that to the hands of whoever controls the journal platforms for the publishers. Um, and I, with that, I think we'd lose the opportunity to support a more uh, inclusive and equitable ecosystem for scholarship and that's the point I'd like to almost end on um, so I think there's a real opportunity here to 
try to come true some of that value um, which of the open access movement, which is just to support more equitable participation in scholarship. Um, we're seeing it because preprints are free, as in free cost. We're seeing it where preprint servers are using different languages. Um, we're seeing preprints being adopted in high and low income settings. There are issues that remain, but there are people trying this out. And a lot of this adoption is being supported by localized advocacy um, uh, and initiatives and people running those kind of like ground and grassroots initiatives to raise awareness and also work out what is working, what isn't working for their community. But a lot of these initiatives um, through the research, it's it's clear that they're not funded. Uh, earlier this week, someone mentioned how funding tends to go to shiny new tech. And I think this is also the case here where the funding is not going to the social processes that are really needed, not only for any adoption, but in particular for more inclusive and equitable adoption and design of preprint services and initiatives. Okay. Um, I'm just going to skip through these bits, actually, in the interest of time, but I just, okay, the main point is that, you know, we could have a thriving woodland, biodiverse, something that everyone can use, or we could lose it to some commercial monoculture, and, you know, I'm all for Christmas trees, you know, I use them myself, but they don't apply to everyone, and it's not very interesting, it's not a space you're going to go and use as a farm, so I just wanted to use that analogy just to say that I think we're at a precipice here, and I think we should really think carefully if we want uh, preference infrastructure to be open infrastructure um we we can't risk losing it at this point um so we are talking about co-budget this week and here's some ideas for what we could do with the uh, the funds that could be raised this week um if we decide that uh we could support existing preprint services who are on closed platforms to look at what they need to do to migrate to open solutions we could uh, have a think about new financing models. I know people have been thinking about it already in this space. It's a tough challenge, uh, but we could try to add some support in that area. We could have a look at whether we can support open preprint services that are specifically designed to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion in scholarship. Um, there are a few that exist and there are some that have been funded, but there's a lot more opportunity and space to do that. And I think I saw in the chat that it's a, a, an opportunity and a challenge because um, it really needs to be done well to meet the goals that it's intended. And pausing there. Thank you very much for listening. Great. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. And I hope that gives you a good sense of, you know, uh, not only the importance of this uh, this area, but then also a flavor for, for the type of research we, we are doing at IOI um, in these different spaces. Um,